Yes. Hello out there in TV land. Uh, I believe I am on the live stream on HowlRound. Um, how is everyone doing this afternoon? All different um, time zones. I hope, I hope. Um, I'm playwright Crystal Skillman and uh, I'm the author of plays like Open that was at the tank uh, with All for One last summer starring um, Megan Hill directed by Jesse D. Hill. Um, and I'm also the book writer of a musical called Mary Max uh, with music composed by Bobby Cronin. And um, I'm working on a few new plays, including Rain and Zoe Save the World, um, which uh, is about two teenage activists uh, who steal a motorcycle and, and shut down, uh, go or attempt to shut down a pipeline. And um, uh, so speaking of Earth Day, which is I, I picked today um, as the day uh, for, to do this session, because I think it's very important for us to remember, um, you know, all the battles we're fighting right now, obviously we're kind of oversaturated, but um, also the glory of what we're fighting for, which is this earth, which is something larger than ourselves. Um, so that's why uh, I'm here today. But one of the um, more specific reasons I'm here today in this hour is that um, if you joined, uh, you know, there are ways to, um, you can ask, a, there's an email on the HowlRound website. If you break that, um, I've got some incredible mentees, um, Caleb and Stephanie, who are looking at that and they will get those questions to me and I can brainstorm a little bit if you're finding um, that you're getting a bit stuck as a writer trying to work in this incredibly stressful time or any specific questions you have about playwriting or theater um, that you think would be helpful for me to address. Um, but basically, um, shortly after this occurred, um, I had a lot of deadlines that I still had to meet. Um, it went to, uh, as we all know, Zoom rehearsals. I'm sure you've been writing some Zoom things um, or perhaps not um, and taking stock of where, where you're at. So. Um, because I had uh, teams that I was uh, had to get, you know, I had to get work to a composer, I had to get work to a director or a producer, you know, how to write during this time is uh, stressful and crazy and a lot, a lot of things. So I began to develop these techniques and I realized that they might be really useful for other writers. And so I began to teach them a little bit at primary stages and then at Pace University where I'm also a professor. So today um, it's kind of my bag of tricks um, for some of these things that I found are helpful to recognize um, the world in which we are living and not be in denial, but also to enjoy and uh, take what we're learning from that into fantasy and fiction and be safe in that place and time, especially for this next hour. Uh, so the first thing um, that we're going to do is I'm going to, um, and again, you might have my video on, uh, I'll stay on, I think, uh, but, um, but I, you know, obviously you can turn, I think you can, I'm not sure if you can turn my video on or not, but off and on, but you can also just listen to my voice and it will be just as effective. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm going to um, ask you to make a list and I'm gonna time you for five minutes. So I will then um, guide you when it's up, um, really three minutes, I think, of uh, things that are stressing you out, everything, everything that is stressing you out. Uh, I have no doubt it is a long list. <laughs> um, so uh, your timer, as they say in Top Chef, starts now. I'm looking for a free writing list, which is pen to paper or typing on your laptop. And you're not gonna take that pen off or keep uh, stop typing. You're just gonna keep typing and you have three minutes to do a list of all the things that are stressing you out. All right, I think we are almost, we're getting there, we're getting there. All of it, all of it. it if, if the dishes aren't on there, I don't believe you because 
this just really, really stressed me out <laughs> in addition to all the other things. Um, I rewatched 12 Monkeys. See, sometimes we're going to it, sometimes we're not. I, I feel like every time we come back, it's a little bit of 12 Monkeys. We're getting, I have to get hosed off from uh, going outside. Um, but every single little stress, you have a minute and a half left. Great, you have 30 seconds. Every last little thing, just shove all the stress in there. Just shove it in there. Every little bit. It can be, remember, this is a list for yourself. No one else is going to see this list. So other people might be on the list. Doesn't matter. You're not going to get in trouble. All good. Great. Um, and in the next few seconds, Go ahead and find a stopping place. It might be a stopping place for now. I'm sure the list can go on and on and on. All right, whoo. It's just a sample, right, of what's there. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to go ahead and close your eyes um, and listen to my voice. And I'm going to, you know, all that stress that's living inside you, I want you to think of them as different strands that are inside you right now. And I'm gonna go inside your heart and inside your body. And one by one, I'm gonna pull these threads out. So I'm gonna take like the biggest one from your list, the one that's just for you feel like it's crushing. It's really crushing. And I'm gonna take that one out. It's gonna be a little hard, but we're gonna pull it out of you. And we're gonna to toss it away. We're gonna let it drift up. We're gonna let it flop where, wherever it goes, it goes, but it's not a part of you anymore. And I want you to take the next stress that comes to mind and let's pull it out and let it go. The next three, let's grab them real tight and yank them out, okay? This is reality. This is what's happened, but not anymore, not right now. It exists, but not in you. You are not responsible for it. It's not a part of your mental state right now. We've let that go. And then all the rest from the list. Just let it pour out of you and feel and breathe without that in you. Because for the next 50 minutes, it is not in you anymore. And that is not selfish, it's a beautiful thing. You deserve that, and that's why you're here today. So the first thing we're gonna do, well, the next thing we're gonna do now in this state in which we accept a few things. We accept that writing is valuable and we accept that words are like gold. We accept that, that it is a beautiful act and it is something that one sometimes must be selfish to do in order to get done, but it is not a selfish act. It is a giving act and it has value. And so by doing it, even when things around us are going a little crazy, it's still a beautiful, important, valuable thing. So the first thing I want you to do is write a list, another list of uh, things that drive you. And I would do them in question form like Jeopardy, things that uh, it's like what I like to call your why today. Why, why are you um, excited about life and living and the things that, you know, it might be pre this all happening, but even now certain observations you've had, wow, that's that's really important to me. I didn't realize that. So you're gonna form them in the form of a question. So um, your why today is, um, why is there climate change? Is that something that you want to, to change or you want to still be a part of your activist life? Um, why 
uh, why can't mothers be kinder to their daughters? Maybe you want to change that cycle. Maybe that's something you're passionate about or exploring. But all the subjects or things that you're interested in um, that drive you, that drive you to do the things you do or new things you've observed. And I'll just do like a minute and a half list, but in question form, as many as you can get down your why todays. Um, the things that when you walk are questions that you have of the world or yourself that you want to investigate, that you think are valuable, that drive you, that you think are powerful. Those are many ways the dramatic questions of your life and the themes of your life. You might not even notice that they're happening, but they are. And let's just see how many we can get down in a minute and a half. Of course, don't think about it too much. Once you start writing, just let it go. It might get a little silly sometimes, and that's great too. Um, <laughs> why does everybody hoard toilet paper, right? That might be a very valid question that comes up in this list, and that's, that's great. And in the next few seconds, find a stopping place for right now. And from that list or just kind of where you're at right now and just being in your writer body and knowing that the writer body is valuable and um, just as powerful as a warrior or um, you know uh, anyone um, in this universe, a very powerful being, a God, so to speak, and that you know all these things, um, I want you to think about I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the three things that you're really excited to write. You might have more. Actually, I, let's just do a, a bit of listing here too, but things on your mind that you've been excited to write and might've been before this all happened or things that you just think are interesting um, based on what you've seen or been feeling, um, but just jot down a few things that, you know, if you had your basket or your bin of things that, um, you've been burning to write. And I would think about it as like, you know, the, the story that if I had to say right now, I had all the money in the world and I had all the resources of the world um, to give you, to support you in that. What, what, is the, what are the ideas that come to mind? It's very hard to pick one right away, but I think go ahead and jot some of those down for yourself. And as you're jotting them down, I want you to pick the top three. So what the, the three that sing to you. And then from the three, I want you to pick one. And I often um, describe this moment as um, a little bit like the dark crystal, which is puppets. It was great that we have this new version, which is fantastic. I love sequels. But um, in, in the original, there was a scene where Jen uh, had these, these shards and they, they glow. Um, uh, well, he plays a little pipe. To be honest, there are three shards and to understand the shard he needs to pick, one glows. And I think there's, a, there's something about one of these ideas that's gonna glow a little brighter than the other. It's gonna talk to you a little bit. Um, and I want you to think about how that idea goes with your why todays and who you are and your DNA and who you are. And kind of start to think about, wow, that's interesting. How, how does that go back to me in some interesting way? Um, and I think let's start there. Let's just take that idea and let's just close our eyes and see if we can picture a scene from this idea and go into it. So to do that, we're gonna do a visualization exercise. So what we're going to do is we're going to close our eyes. I like closing our eyes, I find it very calming. I don't know, I, don't, I know it's not like romper room, but I, I just, I find it calming. So um, you're gonna close your eyes and you're gonna to listen to my voice. Um, you see something different than what I say, totally great. Um, just go with what you see. Um, you're gonna go ahead and see a white space, completely white. I used to say like the matrix, but nobody knows what that is anymore, but it's totally white. And uh, I want you to think about a setting 
that is strong for that idea. It doesn't have to be for every moment of that idea, but just the first idea that comes to mind of a setting. And it should be something that's um, challenging or provocative or evocative, you know? A, a living room or bedroom might be that place. It might be a beach, it might be a park, it might be a lot of things. Um, it could be, uh, you know, a backyard, um, a street. Um, but once you have that place, I want you to take three items from that place and click and drag them into the space. So they're gonna fill out. So maybe if it's a, a beach, maybe it's um, some water, maybe it's uh, you know a shell, maybe it's a fish, um, but three major items that come together or, or, or elements. And I want you to click and drag them into the white space. And as they click and drag into the white space, they're going to go ahead and fill the whole white space with the actual setting. So you're actually inside it right now. And I want you to see a character in that space. I'm not sure if they're in that space right now or if they've entered. I want you to try and see uh, their age, how they walked, characteristics. Um, are they five? Are they 81? Are they, you know, are they in indiscriminate age? Are they, um, um, you know, is, the, is there a gender? Is, you know, is, is there something particular they're wearing? Uh, just kind of take stock of that. And they're doing something, a task, and they feel very, very strongly about this task, or it's something that gives them um, a, a powerful feeling as they're doing this task, and they're um, continuing to do it. Um, I don't know, they might be talking to themselves, they might be singing or humming a little bit, but or they might be doing just the task itself. And then uh, I think another character is either in the space or about to enter. I'm not sure where they're entering from. I'm not sure um, what they look like, um, but in many ways they uh, they might have similarities, but they're they're in some way pretty opposite. There's a there's a strong contrast between these two characters in some way. I'm not sure if they know each other. I'm not sure if they're have a, a, what the relationship is, but try to fill it out as that person is entering and seeing how they enter and what they're doing. And they don't necessarily dislike what the task that the person's doing, but they're definitely interfering in some way. Perhaps they have something else that they want to do. Perhaps they want to get the person's attention. Perhaps they want to help in some way. Um, and it's something that the, your other character is not so sure how they feel about it. Now, as this is going on, I want you to think about they have strong needs from each other as this is going to go on. And those needs are not the same thing, at least not in this moment. But let's um, let's time for five, five minutes and let's see what they write, say, and do. So that is, in essence, could be stage direction, could be action we see on stage, could be the character uh, speaking back and forth, could be a monologue, could be a monologue and a scene um, or scene work or dialogue. So I want you to just go ahead and just like write the very beginning of this and see what comes out. Um, it might be completely wordless, which is great too. Uh, just a quick reminder, all stage directions are in the present uh, because a play can only take place in the present, uh, even if it's a flashback of some kind. Um, and, uh, and have some fun or be playful with the language that, that they're using. See what comes to you, see what you're discovering. And I will also give a countdown for you too, for the time. I didn't tell you how it started. I totally was bad, but your timer has started.
Okay, so you have like two and a half, two and a half minutes left for this little exploratory beginning moment of something. Don't be, um, uh, it's at this time too that I always try to remind myself of uh, beats can be filled with um, your five senses. So uh, you can write it as a beat, but maybe it becomes, um, a, you know, a, a, a sound of a bird, uh, and a sound of an ambulance. Um, uh, the sky turns red. Um, it rains, starts to rain. Um, you know, just using any of your five senses and the environment can be very helpful in any way. If you get stuck in any way too, the characters can use that environment. How many times have we not known what to say next and we start, you know, fiddling with something um, and uh, the person remarks on it or anything like that. Um, uh, I also will say too with characters, you know, they might, um, uh, the thing that binds it is that all theater is live. So it very well might be that your characters are ghosts or animals or, you know, when I say characters, they don't necessarily have to be human. So we'll explore a few exercises. So there's definitely room for play. Um, and I'm sure if your mind wanted to go there, different time periods, of course, can happen. Um, what is now, even now is very interesting. Um, what is now in the current state in which we're living, so. Great, any one minute left? So one minute left. And you have like 20 seconds. A little less than 20 seconds. Great. And in the next few seconds, once you find a stopping place for now, if you have notes about, oh, I think this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, go ahead and write them down, um, get excited. If you wanna stay with it, if you're like, whoa, I just wanna stay here, stay here. I'm gonna introduce a few other little exercises with the same um, uh, situation uh, that can add to different scenes or moments of your play. Um, but it's up to you. You can always stay where you are too or write these exercises down later. You can also always ask to the email what was that? I was working on something else. What was that exercise she was doing? Because I was doing something else. We can always fill you in. Um, and we're going to do some links after for anything that I reference um, in terms of visuals. So we might show a few visuals, but we have are short on time. So um, we might do this as links later. Um, so I just want to bebop around in this idea for a little bit. And this is a technique that I call flash forward or flash back. Um, and then I'll show you how to uh, do a quick outline organize if that's something you're interested in later, but we need content first. I very much think of writing as first, we want the content. And I think of, so when I think of structure, you know, structure is the cup that, you know, holds this, uh, the bones, but the water is the content itself. And, you know, I think that, that um, exploring what the content is first, it just tells you a lot about where you want to go. So, um, uh, for a little uh, fun thing with that, I want to I want you now to dream on, like it could be minutes later, it might be like ten minutes later in this scenario, um, but with these characters, um, and again, if you want to replace these characters, if you're feeling like you want to try some new ones, that's great. But I think it might be great to stay with the same ones. Um, I want you to pick one of the characters that you kind of feel like, wow, I know they're brand new, both of them possibly, but one that you feel like you know a little bit less, or like trying to get a little bit more of a handle on, and or the one who talks less. Those are those are the two categories that kind of help you figure out which one to pick. Um, and I want you to um, uh, uh, okay, put them in a state of high emotion. So high emotion, joy, confusion, um, anger, um, you know, um, uh, um, overzealousness, <laughs> um, uh, just a devastation, love, right? Any of these high states of emotion, right? So I, you know, this is not going to be necessarily right after we you start stopped writing. You're gonna gonna 
dive forward um, uh, further into the play. Um, and so I want you to have that character explain to the other character how they feel as a simile. So we use similes all the time. And this is, a, a, this is one of my bag of tricks. This is a really great exercise that I've always done and it always creates a beautiful monologue basically if you, can, if you sense where I was going. Um, but uh, you know, I'm so mad at you, I, I feel like a balloon that could pop, right? We, we talk like this all the time. You know, I, 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 you know, I look at you and my, my, uh, the heart, my heart is exploding like the fireworks on the 4th of July, right? Like maybe not as corny as some of these things, but we do. We even say, I look in, you, I, in your eyes and I feel like I'm, I'm looking in a mirror and I see myself. Right. So um, the so the character, the first thing to do, not unlike um, sometimes writing a song where you get the lyric hook first, um, like shake it off. Right. <laughs> or whatever the lyric hook is. But like, you know, I want you to get that simile down first. Like, how does this character exclaim how they're feeling to this other character? What is the simile? So just write that down first. Try to get that line down first. I've noticed and I'm sure you have, too, that we often use similes to uh, to explain where we're at, because in a way, weird way to say I'm sad or I'm angry or frustrated, uh, people don't understand, but people are able to put themselves in someone else's shoes when you, when you put it into story or you say it's like this, um, then they can actually understand, hopefully if they've had some kind of similar experience or at least can imagine what that's like. Um, so once you have that simile down, I'm gonna let you go for um, five minutes. And in the five minutes, what I want you to do is I want you to um, build upon that simile. So whatever imagery comes up as a result of that simile, I want you to do. So if it's, if it's I'm, I'm so mad at uh, you, know, you, uh, you know, I feel like a balloon that could pop. Um, I feel like you're squeezing all the air out of everything that I say. And I feel like uh, I try to speak and my voice gets squeaky and strange and it's like someone else has taken over my life. And I used to feel it was like a party, but now I just feel like it's a disaster. <laughs> sometimes, now, sometimes my examples for the simile exercise are not as great. I do it so you can do the great work. So um, I'm sure your simile uh, will be much better than mine. But the imagery, so, you know, and you can go on tangents, it's great. Like it's a rant, really, let's be honest, it's a rant. But, see how that imagery weaves back in. See, see what happens for you as that character keeps talking. If the other character wants to talk, they totally can. I try to keep it small and minimal so that's mostly the other character talking. Uh, you can also always write in the stage direction. Um, even, even the character speaking might get so overwhelmed to go and like, kick something or something like that. Um, there might be a, a st stage lighting, something might change. All, all sorts of things can happen, you know? Uh, another character might be listening in that we don't even see, maybe a ghost or something, we don't know. Um, but let's just see what happens. Um, great. Um, I'm gonna time you for five minutes and see where it goes. Now this is free writing. So this means that for this to work, you've got your simile, let it go. Don't worry if it's good writing or not, it will take care of itself. Do not stress about that in the least. Um, you're just creating something from nothing, which is um, the most fun of all. So your timer starts now. Um, I will definitely keep time for you as you go. If you find yourself stressed out and you'd like, oh, geez, how do I keep going? Um, put a song on, put a song on, let the song and this, this idea of from one image to the next, think about how the words um, uh, are connecting. You can always edit later. I'd rather you overwrite, even if it doesn't make sense. And we can always go back and, and edit. Um, characters not making sense, by the way, can be absolutely terrific because a lot of us don't make sense, right? And, and playwriting really captures these beautiful present moments between people um, or, you know, characters. Um, so think about how each word is like a, it's like a trapeze act. It's catch up, one word's catching the other. Um, and of course they really want to, they really need this other person to understand where they're coming from. So that really drives them. Okay.
we have a little bit more than three minutes left. Sometimes these end up being like half a page or a page. Sometimes they end up being five lines, um, but they always end up being something really interesting and good writing. It was around this time too that things might end up being questions. Uh, the character might end up asking questions of the other character or, 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 or having a new revelation or discovery um, that goes into a new place about themselves or about the relationship or about the other character or the place in, that they're in. Um, something might be exposed in terms of a deeper want or longing or any, any of those things um, might, might be happening. We don't know, but they might be happening. Um, the character might be getting more bold, more loud, um, more exclamatory, might be getting also, or might be getting more quiet, or it might be more space between the words, or might be going faster. You, you can feel it out. You can feel how they're feeling. So just let it come through you. You know, like a, a little less than a minute and a half left. The one minute mark. And this is where it can be kind of fun to be like, if there is something unsaid that they just unearthed, this is the time. If you feel like pencils down, you already got to the ending, then go through and say, and just, you know, you can edit a little bit or lift a line or two or reorganize a little bit if you want to. Just take a look. Is every line present? One of my, um, or uh, active. And I always think uh, a few tricks with that. If a character saying, you know, when it doesn't feel active, then is it something that the char other character already knows that they know themselves? Would they say that? Or I think, because typically our action is in the thought. We usually don't have to say, I think. Sometimes it can be startling though to use that as well. Um, it depends because it can shake things up as well. You take a look at punctuation. Are characters, is the character cutting themselves off? Is there a dash dot consistently? Are there ellipses? Are you through punctuation and how you're laying it out on the page, are you capturing how the character talks, do you think? Uh, you could also add a stage direction before and after. You could also add a response after. So that all may be happening in that moment. You may still be like, ah, writing, so that's great. We have time, we're tra transitioning here. Um, we're gonna go into the last part of just exploring this one idea. We're gonna do another flash forward, um, just to prep you so as, you're, as you're finishing up. So it's gonna be a moment where I like to call this moment. Um, so maybe I will do, uh, I'll, I'll say belly of the whale, but I'll show you a little visual after so that um, you can think about um, with this idea, um, uh, you know, organizing a little bit more. If you, this is something you want to explore deeper in a shorter play or a longer play, um, or these characters. Um, the uh, I call this the belly of the whale um, moment, and then in the belly of the whale moment in the hero's journey. Um, and when I say hero, I'm not picturing any gender. I'm not picturing any class. I don't know. You know, it could be a rabbit. I don't know. Uh, I love Watership Down. Many of you that know me know I love Watership Down very much. <laughs> Great hero's journey, but. Um, uh, in this case, in the belly of the whale, uh, the character has to make an important choice before they can get out of where they are. Um, in this case, between these two characters, um, it's a moment where they, whatever has been, um, um, it's kind of a little bit of a point of return, no return to. So like wherever anything's been said that is dangerous, you know, it's going to be said or dealt with here or the person's going to be called on it. But one person doesn't want to let the other person leave the room. They may very well attempt to leave. Um, and I think we'll just do three minutes for this, for like a quick, short exchange between these two characters where later in the play, um, enough has come out 
um, that these characters have dealt with or um, a secret is about to come out in the moment what you're just about to write, that is going to force the other character to have to deal with that or um, a discovery or a revelation or they want to try to leave or they want to give them something or um, I want you to explore what that is. But this is a scene that would be later like leading to the climax of the piece. Um, and I just want to see what they say to one another and what they do. Um, I'm going to give you three, uh, it may be all stage directions. Sometimes you might not have dialogue yet. My um, uh, trick for dialogue is I'm never afraid to write on the nose because I know I can replace it later. So I never really worry if it's a great line when I first write it. I think of them like little gems, like I could polish, I can always polish them later. Um, this is an exercise and I'm more interested in discovering the moment and what the moment is. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's dialogue, maybe that's all stage direction, maybe it's an idea, maybe it's both. Um, so your three minutes starts now to just explore this moment between these two characters where whatever pretenses they have are beginning to fall away and they're starting to look at each other and see each other in a different way. Um, and it may be scary what they see, or they might really like what they see, um, they might be falling in love with what they see, they may be repelled by what they see, I'm not sure, or have discovered. Um, uh, and, you know, put how you feel in this moment with everything that you've been going through in the past month into these moments, into this, this, these moments that you're writing right now. Um, because most likely there's something that someone was afraid to say, something frustrated um, or discovery. Um, and I bet you dollars to donuts that you've had similar as if kind of feelings recently, even though they may not be the exact feelings. Um, but let's just sketch that out. You may also see where they are. They might be in a different place within that setting, which would be kind of interesting. Um, or, you know, the setting may also have changed. The lighting may have changed. The time of day may have changed. Maybe days later, even. It could be even uh, months later. I'm not really sure. But let's just see what they do and say. And it's just a little moment. So let's, let's do two more minutes and then we'll move on. Great, and we've got like 40 seconds left. Great, and this is, now we have the 30 seconds. So anything that hasn't been exclaimed or happened or there might be an implosion happening, uh, maybe even a last visual of this kind of moment or it could even be leading to the end of the play. Um, that's all really interesting. Let's see what happens. And 10 seconds, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Well, we just did three little snippets and moments of an idea that came from you, things that you were um, uh, driving you. Um, and it came from uh, uh, emerging from the outside world, but also embracing um, uh, fiction. Um, and so just really quick, just to kind of review a little bit, um, let's see here, I'm gonna do a little screen share. Let me see, gonna... Thea, can we um, unlock the screen share? We might do a little screen sharing here. Um, and then we're gonna move on and do um, a different exercise, I think. Um, oh, look at that, look at Thea. Thank you, Thea, this is so amazing. Um, let's see here, let's do desktop. And let's, I'm sorry, it's so, um, 
It's disturbing. <laughs> um, this is what I call my structure packet. I use it with my students. Um, it covers a few different things. This is actually, I use this for teaching high schoolers, but I just love it. I think it's pretty terrific. So I just want to introduce this in case you do not know it. Um, it's called Five Steps to the End. I'm often, again, uh, creating content and then looking at it and what is it. So this is probably way too early, but if you're liking um, some of the ideas that you've been working on today or these scenes, um, a good way to start to think about you know, how they, they get structured together. I don't know why, but for me, five plot points is a really terrific, exciting number. I don't know what it is. Um, and plot points, to just to remind ourselves, are not every nail that holds up um, this uh, the rooms that we are in or our house, but they are the main nails that keep it together. They're the bones, uh, as we call it, of structure. So in the, in the trick of five steps to the end, you just go one, two, three, four, five. You put the first action of the play, and you could do this with a short play, like you can do this with a 10 minute play, you can do this with a 60 minute play, do this with a 90 minute play, because the, there will be five plot points no matter what. There may be more, but there are at least five essential ones, most likely. Um, uh, so I use here a quick example, um, Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, by the way, uh, I don't know if there's any teenagers on the line, but often uh, teenagers have to explain to them Jack and the Beanstalk unless they've been into the woods, in which case we are okay, giants in the sky. But um, Jack sells the cow to get magic beans. Uh, so this is the, uh, I have the little notes here for the high schoolers. Um, you put the, so basically the first, part of the story, right? Then here's the trick. And this is always the way to do it, no matter how you do this five plot point thing. Skip to the fifth one. Jack chops down the beanstalk and kills the giant, right? As you've noticed, I mean, I've kind of already told you these answers. We've got the want established here. We've got exposition going here. We've got also the resolution. Now what's great is from two, three, and four, start to think, how do I get there? You know, if you look at a Pixar movie, that's very much what they're doing, right? There's this really great concept. There's this great thing, and we'll um, post a link to it. I'm sure you've seen the Pixar um, story rules that they have. There's like 22 or something. They get their minds jazzed, um, and I find they're very creative and really lovely. And they are very inventive ways of looking at cause and effect, which is very similar to what this is doing. But um, what this does, in a very simple way, without having to do huge outlines or huge treatments, at least for talking to yourself at the very beginning, is that it's, you know, in two, three, or four, we don't have room for a character to go get a stick of gum, unless it's like going to majorly pay off, right? Because these are plot points, right? Um, and we know there's a bunch of cause and effect within them. So that's just something I like to do. So this is a technique where I might create some content like what we just did, and then I might ask myself, um, how that works in a larger story. Uh, some of the questions I always do is I always try to uh, use setting, which is what I was doing with you when I was, was talking, I was asking certain questions about setting. So this is just that, that from that packet. Um, I also wanna show you guys, um, when I do a lot of my hero's journey classes, this is from Action Philosophers, which my husband, Fred Van Lente wrote and Ryan Dunleavy drew. And it is like a board game and it does indeed have pop culture references, which is something I adore. Um, uh, but here, belly of the whale, you know, we have called to adventure as we know. Ooh, look, I'm making things on here. This is like terrible. I'm just like not even, not educated about PDFs. Um, but uh, like here's our very matrix -y moment, obviously in every story, right? Some there's a call to adventure, why the adventure begins. Crossing the first threshold is pretty exciting because it's a moment that a character um, can no longer go back in the story. Um, here, uh, Spider-Man and Peter Parker are now, um, two separate people in a way within one person. And that's not something he can really go back from um, because he's also made a vow because he lost his uncle. So all those elements, not just putting on the costume, not just doing the wrestling match and making a big bag of money, which is, you know, interesting, all good stuff in terms of what this is referencing, but it's a point from which he, Peter Parker cannot come back in the story. With great power comes great responsibility, as they like to say. Um, and the belly of the whale is what we did and here it's illustrated by Pinocchio a little bit. Um, so I just, the reason why I sometimes like to look at the hero's journey is um, it's definitely um, great to, obviously if you're writing screenplays, it's almost pretty much this in your own creative way. But um, uh, it reminds me of obstacles, you know, um, that even in a 10 minute play, you know, there are things that the characters are trying to do. And then all you have to do um, is remember that a new obstacle is introduced. So that's something that as well, when I start to come up with some content and ideas, um, uh, obstacle plus conflict, new action, new obstacles, but don't forget the new action. You know, that's something that I always forget. And then those new obstacles can keep things going. So that's just looking at the content you have and, and going forward with that. Um, if you have any questions, there is an email up, up on uh, HowlRound. So if you are having any specific 
writing issues or questions um, like, I can't get started. I don't um, um, know how to work my time in this. And this is the other thing I will say about this in terms of, uh, oh, let's stop sharing. That'll be great. Um, let's see, let's go back here. Okay, great. Um, uh, the other thing I will say is that um, uh, your time is going to be different. And I think you've noticed this. Uh, well, duh, of course you have. Um, so even if it's just you get one teeny little thing done, and maybe you used to write in the morning, and now you the only hour you have is like three to four, um, or you only have 30 minutes, um, I would start to think of dream, uh, dreaming on, on thoughts and ideas, making thoughts and ideas. Um, uh, if you could even jot down a few thoughts, I think that's terrific for a day. The amount of work you can do in a day is gonna be different and it's gonna be divided up differently. Um, in your house, you're gonna find different sources of power and places you wanna write um, that give you inspiration. And I definitely think mixing it up is a good idea within your house itself if you can, even writing in the kitchen, like like just, just uh, anything you can do um, to kind of find and experiment for yourself with that variety. Um, and of course, if you don't write every day, that's great too. Um, th hopefully this exercise of trying to lift out from the stress is really terrific. I think it's just also important that at least for me, and I'm just sharing what, how I'm, I'm personally doing it. I think about it like being at war, there are things happening, but it, this work is valuable as well because also the work you're creating, if this is work you want to go out and share, um, this is a time of development to do that and people will want and need these things now a year from now, two years from now. Um, and I think that, you know, if you have a, a gift, I think it's important and if you feel comfortable using it to um, explore it. Um, I'd love to end, and we're gonna see if there's any questions, please do ask if you, uh, again, we can problem solve and help you through anything, uh, writer's block or anything like that. Um, but I would like to end with a really fun exercise I just came up with. I call it the origin of theater exercise and just started it yesterday. It just ended up being really cool. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm going to give you five minutes and I want you to write me a scene. Um, and I think maybe, maybe there's a place where HowlRound can post some of these PDFs too, because that, because um, this will be up. And if you want to share it, I think it might be neat if you guys want to do want to share some of these things. Um, but go ahead and write me a scene about what you think, how, how did theater, how did, first of all, it's a big reset button. Like we're talking about theater. How can we do it? Can we get in a space? Is it all virtual? What, what is powerful? and being virtual, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's interesting to ask ourselves even like, what is this thing called theater that we got so obsessed with? Um, what, where did it come from? Is it aliens? Is it fairies? Is it, is it, is it uh, cavemen? I don't know. But um, uh, I'm going to give you five minutes to write a scene. It could be a scene, monologue, um, or just stage direction, description um, of the origin of theater. And go crazy, go nuts. Don't worry. Uh, you can be as fantastical as you like, obviously. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go ahead and see what happens. I'll give you guys four minutes for that. So four minutes to write a scene or a moment. When I say the words, the origin of theater, you know, um, what's that scene that comes to mind for you? How did it come to be? How did this wild and crazy thing come to be that now we're all on our little computers? But before that, or maybe it involved computers, who knows? Maybe it's robots. Hey, Thea, and some people were saying they can't hear me, I think. Can you hear me? Let's see. Hopefully. Hopefully it's all good. Yes. I wonder if my volume, does my volume matter on this thing? I don't know. Could you say something so I can hear you? Now I'm like paranoid. Hey, yeah, I'm uh, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Okay, then I got the singer. Okay, cool. Fab fabulous atrocity. Um, that's a word. 
It's absolutely a word. Um, I have some questions here too, so I'm gonna answer those in a little bit. Let's see here. But for the origin of the, the origin of theater, it's very important. It's what, you know, we're gonna teach the wee ones this scene. <laughs> um, do you have like two minutes left? Again, you may not completely finish this. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, as you continue to write, I'll, I'll say that in class, some of the techniques that we've been doing, um, messing around how to use this format. It's a puppet show. Um, uh, we uh, would do a screen sh uh, share screen when we read, read these origin of theater scenes. And then we, we considered this space the bonfire so that we would take the origin of theater scenes and we'd share the share screen and read the parts together. Um, almost like we were around a bonfire sharing with each other what that origin was, what we thought that was. All right, we got some questions here. Um, we uh, For the rest of this, we have one minute. <laughs> so quick. I did, I did give them 10 minutes, by the way, in my class, just so you know. So typically this exercise can be really terrific with 10 minutes, but uh, you know, it's a little bit of a smorgasbord. I wanna make sure you had a few um, um, exercises. Great. Oh, these are really, really good questions. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, 30 seconds left to finish out this. Now, if you already finished this exercise, which I don't think you did in five minutes probably, but something I like to do if you're doing it for 10 minutes or you're leading this exercise, if you happen to be a teacher, um, still use these use these techniques. Um, the uh, I say, I say, if people are done, they're like, I'm done. Um, I was like, okay, we'll write a prologue and an epilogue to your origin. And actually they ended up being pretty cool, the prologues and origins. I will also say that um, one of my students did not write a scene at all and wrote this really riveting piece of text. It almost read like a book or something. It was really, really great. It was like it was torn from a book about the origin theater. It was pretty cool. Um, cool. So we're going to go to some, some questions right now, but that's okay. You completely can keep writing. You know, anything I say, if you are in your own zone, you know, don't, don't let me take you out of it. Um, and we can always multitask, which is terrific. Um, okay, so this is, I think this is from, uh, let's see, I'm not exactly sure who this is from. Caleb, maybe let me know some names here, but I'm doing the one of when you're writing about a real place thing or idea, but you're using that just to talk about something bigger. How, I think this is Marianne. How important is this to get that real thing um, perfectly accurate? Um, Okay, so research, something based on research or historical work. Uh, actually, my husband, Fred Van Lente, uh, does some nonfiction comics as well as fiction. And he taught me a little trick that I really like. And that is, um, I try to, to imagine, to understand the given circumstances that are that are realistic, but I'm, you know, like, so it's believable, which honestly is the big thing, right? Whether it's, whether you're coming from an, uh, you know, a fact or something completely made up or something kind of inspired by your real life and like totally mostly made up or any of these combos, um, you know, William Goldman is correct in that believability is everything. So as long as we can believe it can happen, which means the given circumstances are true, right? Um, now, if this is a play where we see through the perspective of elephants and it's about, you know, two elephants, you know, or it's about a bunch of elephants um, who are auditioning for, a, you know, a ballet act and in that world, it makes sense. It makes sense. So like, it, again, it's believability is within the world and what you're doing, um, which is kind of like why I like not doing naturalism because it can be very um, binding and restricting. To come back to historical work, I find you just want to know just enough. You want to know enough to get your imagination going, to have uh, fl this flesh and blood of these people and let them speak and not have not worry about, oh gosh, is every word that they're saying historically accurate? That is something that you can think about later. Is it a play that has contemporary references? Um, meaning like, do they say fuck? And like, you know, maybe it's caveman times and like the it wasn't that word wasn't created yet again that's a stylistic thing right uh and i think in the beginning almost like creating content you're going to want to explore that at some point when you have enough of, of solidness of the excitement of what the dramatic question is or the store or the basic story then i would start to um go back and research a little bit more so it's like i would almost like almost like the water like content and the the, the cup with the structure just enough 
then go research, research. Oh, okay, well, I'm not sure. Okay, that this was on the Hoover Dam, but you know what? This intake tower, you know, couldn't do that. Oh, but they could do that in this level. Okay, well, I'm going to adjust that or here, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so, so I think it's that balance because you don't want to cut off creativity. You want to let the history fuel the creativity and go back and forth. Um, uh, and I also a big, big thing to remember with that is um, your job as a writer is not to explain how things happen, right? So it's not to like teach the history. Like if I'm writing a play about the Hoover Dam, it isn't to teach about the Hoover Dam because they can watch documentaries on the Hoover Dam. They can read, you know, anyone can read a book on the Hoover Dam. What is the story? We go to watch humans um, or, or humans um, embody things. So um, it's great. Um, so that was that answers that question. Uh, been playing around and thinking about storytelling that doesn't follow the normal beginning, climax, ending. Cool. So I become aware that kind of story just follows the male orgasm. Yes, it does. Little yes, 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 it does. It's very, um, in fact, that graph first came up when I was learning playwriting and I almost threw up and um, yeah, I thought I wasn't a playwright, but I was wrong. Okay. Do you have any exercises advice for writing non-linearly or stories that may not follow typical structure? I hope this makes sense. Okay. Uh, I actually think the hero's journey is helpful in that sense. And I know it's seen as a, as a, as a male thing. Sometimes it's called the heroine journey. It has adapted things. Because when I see it, I'm not trying to, I find that because our minds are so creative, um, we don't actually go like your climax is not going to be like a mammoth climax. Like it's just not possible. So we could use the word climax, but it would be very different. Um, I think about so sometimes I do use those references, but I would say the easiest would be something like five steps to the end, the five steps thing, right? Like it can rest on a climax in a certain way. Typically the fourth plot uh, point ends up being fourth, but you can think of them as almost like five cue cards, right? So the five cue cards could really go in a circle, right? They can go in any shape or direction. It's uh, a matter of visualization that speaks to you about how one thing leads to the other and what people are discovering and what that means. And it might be completely language in your world. It might be words activating something else. Um, as long as the piece, here's also a very quick way to put this. Um, let me just draw you a little something. Great. So this is, this is actually all you need to know if you want to really like make your own structure and not like, you know, worry about the stuff is the one thing that is true, no matter what kind of play we're making, if it's a five hour play, doesn't have a climax at all, takes place in a shop and you have to find the location and it's immersive or whatever's going on. Um, uh, all theater is the, in the present. Okay, I'm just doing a circle for now because I like cross and stuff. Um, and there's the past and the future, okay? The past and the future are pressing into the present. In a story, when we're making a story that is a play, we have a timeline of events, right? So if I did a timeline, it might be like for my day, I wake up, I have oatmeal, I go here, I go there. Maybe from, but maybe for your character, the eating oatmeal is like gonna be a huge, amazing thing and experiencing them eating that on stage is going to make us feel a certain way because they start weeping into the oatmeal like 15 minutes in. We're like, oh my God, who is this person? I don't know. In my story, maybe I cut that out. Maybe, I don't know. But what we're gonna do from that timeline is we're only gonna put things in the present that are active. And things that, and so we don't, and we don't have to show the past or explain the past because the past is in the present. It fuels the present. The future, like even if someone could be pregnant, maybe we don't see the birth of the child because the future looms, right? Future looms. We can show any elements of that we want, but as long as it's present and alive and, and, and there's something at stake, it does not need to be in a certain, does not need to be the male graph. It, it can be in any shape that you want. So I would start to almost like map it out for yourself how you need to see it. Um, so uh, I find visualizations and drawing very helpful for that. Uh, you can also go from setting and a map of the world. You can do that as well. And that can be very helpful for uh, alternative structures. I went to art school, so um, definitely like visualization a lot. Um, here's another one question for someone who's starting uh, a brand new project with no formal deadlines. What advice do you have for carving out time? I do journal every day, but formal creative writing, I still have a mental block <laughs> starting. Um, you know, I trained myself a little bit in this weird little journal I had that gave you, um, okay, how did you, we do it first. Okay, you had, you, you, you can make your list for the day, like the things you felt like you had to do. You had to pick the top five. And so I would just make this about writing. So that's easier, like the thing. And, and pick the top five and then put them in order and then give them each 30 minutes, like 30 minute bubbles and time yourself for 30 minutes to accomplish those tasks. And what that makes you do is really get minute. But basically, you can also just adapt that philosophy. Um, you can um, 
you can be, you know, adapt it basically. So if it, so it's a matter of saying, you know, um, it, cause Maggie, I, I know Maggie, so I can use Maggie as a business example. You're working on something that's very comedic, but it's exploring um, large issues and relationships of a mother and daughter um, in a certain way. And so what are, you know, is it, is it um, a, a, someone character needs, needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. You need to know the history of that character you want to explore with a different beginning and ending all those things take time just break down the time okay i'm going to spend an hour um re-looking at how the beginning speaks to the ending i'm going to spend i think this will take three hours working on the climax of this show and i just kind of want to write this confrontation scene i might throw it out but let me let me see what it is so like you may not and again it always ends up being longer than you think but you can start to do that and then you can look at each day and you do not have to do everything in one day do not do everything do not do everything in one day that's why a little bit when it's like you know i understand not wanting to write every day i understand very much wanting to just consume media and, and a lot of other things. But I also think it's igniting things within you that you might want to explore. And again, if you just do even something very small, you can actually start almost like little droplets of water in a pail uh, on something that you may have uh, something of by like September, very easily, maybe by June, maybe, you know, or right now, you just put it up on Zoom. Um, cool. Great. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, device. Uh, do you have any advice for processing or dealing with internalized? Um, oh, I also will say the last thing about the time thing. Don't beat yourself up. Like if 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 you can't wake up at six in the morning, it's totally cool because I cannot. Um, if it's something that happens over lunch in a certain way or coffee, like kind of associate the little creature habits that work around that time, um, and figure out when when that works. Um, and, and check your progress by the end of the week and start to look at that way as well, see what happens. Um, do you have any advice for processing or dealing with internalized uh, criticism? I've been getting feedback on my business writing. Okay, okay, yes, okay, yes, okay. That's interesting, Rebecca, okay. So different kinds of writing, right? Like I, quick example, I did not think I was a playwright. This is why I went to art school for photography and I ended up uh, studying sculpture on a lot of great things. And I'm really, really grateful. As you can see, I live like, like, a, like an art school baby, <laughs> but um, every kind of writing is different. And so every writing has a different uh, kind of uh, function. Like essay writing is very different than playwriting. So I uh, was only a B plus student really in writing. So I, I just was like, I'm not a writer. Like, you know, I can't spell, which is true. You all know my actor friends out there are like, she cannot spell. Um, it's easier now with technology. So, uh, you know, you get certain criticisms because of, of different forms of writing require different things. People also speak about criticism differently, especially in a work environment. Um, you know, because they're, it's very different. Like it's very systematic in a way. Creativity and creative writing isn't as systematic. And so therefore finding your own way to process criticism is crucial. And every single writer is absolutely different. I call it driving my own process. And when I teach my students, I, you know, I, you know, I, I almost every student has had a moment where I've gone crazy because they come in, they've, they've been working on the most beautiful scene and they come in, they're like, oh, well, I got rid of that first line because it was stupid. And I was like, wait, no, that was, that was amazing. Like why? They're like, well, I, I showed it to my sister. My sister doesn't like it. I'm like, no disrespect. I was like, who's your sister? Bring her to me because is she a writer? Does she, has her written other stuff? Like it's very different for someone who isn't a writer or isn't in this craft and world to process something that someone said out loud to them that they're writing as opposed to seeing it on stage, in which case the sister might love that line, but maybe she can't imagine it that far. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know her. Right. So like, it's about feedback is, and this is why you can't just ask random people for feedback. You have to know the person, you have to know their style. So even when I talk, you can be like, eh, Crystal is the thing with sisters, you know? So I know that she might harp on that when she talks back to me. So you can put them, you can you can figure out how to put them and you have to go back to your own gut, meaning you have to know what you want to do with it in terms of driving your process. What are your actual questions and what are your feelings and gut instincts on it? If someone is saying something in terms of feedback and it does not ring true to you, um, it's usually wrong. But typically what has happened is they have suggested a solution that is wrong, but the solution is not the person who gives feedback's job. That's our job. All they need to do is, is, you know, this part didn't quite flow, or I was confused here, or, oh, I'd love that, but geez, I wonder if there was another image, so that your mind can think and go, and they can sense um, things that are working or not working. 
that's what people can do. They can give their instincts and their feelings. They can answer specific questions about characters and, and what they're getting. They cannot tell you how to fix it. They cannot tell you what to do. And in most cases, their solutions are wrong. Now, other playwrights can, uh, I found, can give terrific, great different solutions. I don't always take them, but I think they're, they're really helpful. But I would say they're very different than the solutions I might get from someone in another industry. I hope that that helps or within different parts of our industry. Um, and sometimes they'll say something I like a kernel of, but I'm going to take it forward my own way. Um, the other thing I think is extremely important is if you have an internal critic that is um, hurting you, that is like uh, making it so you can't write, that's telling you, you know, I, you know, this is not going to be good. Like, don't start. Oh, that's horrible. Like you're trying to write and because again, get it out and then figure it out later. Don't judge yourself when you write, because if you judge yourself when you write, you're never right. Paul Simon says something that I think is amazing. He says about criticism, he says, ask that voice to identify itself. I think he got this somewhere else from some psychiatrist, but ask that voice to identify itself. And, and if it can't identify itself, then what is it? So the truth is it doesn't really exist. It's, you know, your ego, because your ego would rather that you fail than succeed because then, you know, it, it wins. It's like, aha, I knew, you know, it just wants absolute. And that's a big deal of what we're talking about today too, is feeling, com Ugh, it's so weird to say this, but feeling comfortable in uncertainty. Today, we are doing things that we can do. We can write, we can rewrite, we can make things, we can change things. We can do that. When we go into the outside world, this is more complicated, right? We're living in an uncertain time. Um, but I think the power of that is about, um, you know, being able to drive your own process and drive through those things that are um, that little voice in your ear. In fact, the first thing I would do is I would pluck it out and I would throw that little inner critic on the ground and I would squish it um, because it really means nothing. It's really, it's really minutia. It's just, just fear. And um, uh, I have yet to meet a playwright that has written a beautiful play on the very first draft. I think Edward Albee used to say he used to do it, but I, I don't know if that's really true. Um, and I, I know it takes drafts and drafts and drafts. So if it takes drafts and drafts and drafts, just get it out and see what it becomes. And, and, and if you're getting tired, have some actor friends read it. And in fact, I would say that's what I'd love to leave you with today is that I'd love to leave you with uh, a little bit of homework, which is that whatever you've been working on, maybe um, take it forward and to um, talk to Maggie's thing, maybe um, in terms of timing and schedule, uh, I think that was another one. Uh, there are some great, great tricks here. So I dramaturg my own work in the mornings because my eyes are fresh and my mind is fresh. And when I dramaturg what I've written, I try to look at it as if I hadn't written it, like almost like an artifact or something. And I try to go through the beats because I'm interested in how the beats line up. And so I'll do that. I'll see how it works and I'll do some edits and revise the scene. Then um, typically at some point that I'll, I'll revise a little bit. This is a little bit more in a traditional non-pandemic like world, but like there's still a little bit of this that I'm still able to keep, um, not every day, but maybe every other day. Um, and then, well, you know, there is something in this world I think we are connecting with, which is something called happy hour. You don't have to drink, but I would say that typically in Harper Lee talked about this, she would get her glass of wine at like seven and she would look over what she'd written or whatever she worked on the day. Now writing too, that could be thoughts, that could be your notes, that could be journals. So just kind of like either looking through that revised moment or kind of placing your thoughts and, and collecting them um, in a calm way um, and, uh, and making your notes for the next day or in three days from now, what you wanna tackle. Um, but that kind of thing can be really helpful. If you're, um, in fact, you could start at the six o'clock hour if you want. And then if you like to write at night, then you might wanna explore some things and then sleep in in the morning and then, and then look at something. Um, I think it is challenging right now if you have a day job, um, especially on the, you know, like at, at, at home, in addition to doing this, because uh, everything's happening all in your house all at once, everything's on the computer. Um, so I would definitely um, try to understand that even in a meeting where you feel like you have to give this, but you know, you're, you're, you're actually not part of the meeting, but you know, you have to show up. Maybe there, you, you're paying attention, but maybe there's like two things that like you can take notes on or dream of or think about when you get, there's a way to multitask during the day job, it's actually quite hard or maybe like during the lunch hour, but don't try to fill it with too much. Try to explore one thought or one idea or ask yourself, why does that character do that? Or is there something more driving them? Or do you wanna write a monologue or something like that? This really, really, really small stuff I think is helpful um, because then you can uh, do more when you have like an hour as opposed to five minutes. Um, any final questions? Anyone, Caleb, uh, Stephanie? Um, I think I think that's pretty much um, it for now. Um, uh, I'm really excited. Oh, I wanted to do one last thing and that for anyone who's still listening and um, you can continue this after the call. 
as we return to the outside world. Um, I want you to take how you're feeling right now. And I want you to write your own simile exclamation. And um, just write that one sentence. And if you want to, after we get off the call, that might become a monologue for you. Um, but I want you to go ahead and um, just uh, take that, or it could even be about returning to the, the outside world or anything else that creeps in. Um, but it also might be, maybe you're feeling good right now, um, hopefully, and it might be about that as well. So something exclaiming about yourself that simile, I feel like da 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 dee da da boop boop boop. Um, and let's just leave with, leave with that. Um, uh, please do follow up. We're gonna do some posts um, uh, to talk really quickly about the origin of theater. I think it's really helpful to look at these clips from the, um, the electric play, uh, Mr. Burns and Washburn's play. I found this really great clip from Playwrights Horizons. I think she's the best. Um, and we'll put some other fun creative clips for you to look at for um, fuel for thought for um, really evocative theatrical experiences that are playing very well. Um, through um, video, but also can get you dreaming about your own language, your own work, your own characters. Um, thank you very much. Thea, I think that's it probably, unless there's anything on your end. Nope, that's it. Thank you so much and uh, yeah. have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.